Uh, he is, uh, she's the director and, I guess, founder of the Virginia Medical Freedom Alliance. We first heard her at the Breakfast Club in Williamsburg probably last year, and she rocked the world then, uh, giving information, valuable information, and exposing some of the myths and, and what to do about COVID. So with this resurgence of it, I just felt like, you know, let's nip this thing in the bud. Let's get a get on top of it before, and e even in our chat just last week, uh, it's already escalating, as we see in schools in California, different places like that, and hospitals, of course, are already mandating masks and everything like that. And listen, I want to say this. This is kind of a disclaimer. If you have had COVID and you got vaccinated, there is no condemnation to you, okay? That's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to do that. And uh, hopefully Dr. Fury will share some uh, health things for you that could help you through that time and uh, experiences that you're having, medical issues that you're having since you've had vaccinations and not. We just want, we want the truth, amen? And I, th I know we're going to hear that tonight. And uh, so just let's open our heart and let's just pray. Father, we thank you that you're the spirit of truth, the spirit of the Lord, Holy Spirit. Jesus said this about you, that you were the spirit of truth. And when you came, you would show us, lead us, and guide us into all truth. And we ask you tonight that, Lord, that you would touch our hearts, our lives, that we would hear you speak to us individually, Lord, that you would show us what we should do, Father, about these things that are coming, Lord, even now upon us again. We do pray over Dr. Sheila Fury. We pray for your protection, your blessing over her. And we pray that, Lord, that you would just continue to use her, Lord, to speak and help people, Lord. And we just receive what you have for us tonight through her words of wisdom and knowledge and medical understanding, Lord. In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I give you Dr. Sheila Fury. God bless you. Thank you for having me here tonight. It's a really an honor to be here. I never thought I would be in this position. And if we would go back to 2020, our world's all changed. And we have been divided and separated in a way that I never imagined would occur in our country, but in our families. And over the last three and a half years, we have each experienced a tremendous amount of pain and suffering. And that hasn't just occurred because of a virus. It has be occurred because of all the measures that were implemented by our government and the medical establishment. And if I can do anything, I want to bring about healing and know that healing, ultimate healing, comes from God, and that God is the divine physician. And that as a physician, I must be open to his presence and his will, not only in my life, but as he guides me with patience and as he guides me with medical knowledge, and he asks me to speak, because sometimes it's not easy. I don't, I don't want to scare anyone, frighten anyone. I simply want to present information that I believe will help all of you and empower you as an individual, empower your family, empower the church, and empower the community. It is my belief that churches and God and churches in that order will lead us out of this. And if we do not have our faith and if we are not firmly planted in the word of God, we cannot move forward. And of course, I'm old now, and so seeing <laughs> the monitor in the back is a little difficult. But I want to tell you that this is for educational purposes only. I have to give you this disclaimer, because I am not your personal physician. 
All of the information given tonight is from independent medical sources. All right, and I will tell you what those are. And, but this is for educational purposes. There are plenty of sites that we will list and that are available to give you additional information, information that you can take to your physicians, okay? We have a choice. We can live in fear. And this is what happened in 2020. It was two weeks to flatten the curve, which went on and on and on. What the medical community failed to do was look at the miraculous healing power of the body and what the body needs in order to heal and to recognize those doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals around the world who were treating and healing the patients afflicted with COVID and our medical establishment took their licenses, fired them, and tried to shut them down, and in some cases worldwide put them in prison. God is an empowering God, and love asks us to reach out to one another. And as a physician, I know that the most important part of healing is touch and being connected to those that we love and having those that we love at the bedside. But our medical community stopped those visits. And so many patients died alone in fear without their most precious members of their family at their side. Many of those families had uh, members had already recovered from COVID and were not at risk, and yet they were not permitted at the bedside. I never want to see this kind of corruption separate a family again. When you look at medical decisions, you have to look at them through the risk benefit, and alternatives. And one of the most important things that we were told by the medical establishment is that it was your duty to follow these things, instructions. It was your duty to take a shot that was emergency use authorization in order to protect grandma and grandpa. Medically, that is coercion. And that is never the way that you make a medical decision. You never sacrifice one person for another. You provide for the individual in front of you with everything you have. And we don't put the lives of our children who are at zero risk with an unproven, untested shot. Risk, if I am elderly and I have multiple medical problems, this may be something that I'm willing to take the risk on. I'm willing to say, some people are willing to say, I, I get it, this is what I'm willing to do. That's my personal decision. I understand that the risk or the dangers of this are unknown. And you take that step. Because you wanted a benefit that would be, I would not get COVID. That was the promise. The promise was, you take two shots, you won't get sick, and you won't spread it. And we very quickly learned that didn't work. We also have to recall that our medical community has a very long history of being dishonest. 
It is a very sad history. Many of you are aware of the Tuskegee trials that only ended in 1970. So the Tuskegee trials were when they injected syphilis into the African-American community and they failed to treat it when we had penicillin. It was a horrific crime. It is not the only crime of the medical community. And we could go through a long list, but I'm not going to do that tonight. Alternatives. What do nutraceuticals offer us? What do alternative medicines offer us? What does the air offer us? What does hyperbaric oxygen offer us? There are many alternatives that are available and have been shown to be effective in the treatment of COVID-19. And we should each be able to make our own decisions. The battleground, so what we were told is we need double-blind placebo-controlled studies, the gold standard of the pharmaceutical industry. When you are in the midst of a pandemic, you do not. As a physician, you have the right to use everything in your armamentarium. Right? Throw the kitchen sink if you think it will work. The issue is that you want to be safe. So if what you're using to treat the patients has an established safety record, then why not try it? And that's what we had with ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. We had decades of proof of the safety and efficacy of these drugs. And so people said, let's try them and see what happens. Currently, we are learning about two new Omicron variants. And if we go back to early in the pandemic, we heard about the Delta variant, which was very severe and caused significant inflammation. And when treating those patients, it often took ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, high-dose steroids, et cetera, to treat those. When we got to Omicron, we began to breathe because it was not as severe and not as aggressive. And when we talk about variants, there have been thousands and thousands of variants since the beginning. We are just seeing two emerge to the top at, the, at this moment. And it doesn't mean that there aren't other variants. And if we give it another three or four months, we will have other variants. So when we talk about the vaccine or the shot, because it's truly not a vaccine, because the nature of a vaccine must is that by definition, it must prevent you from getting it and if you don't get it, you can't spread it. That has not happened. We knew that coronaviruses rapidly mutate or change and have different variants. And so the chances of us creating a shot that would protect us from the common cold are slim to nil. So an injection that goes in your arm now is an old variant. It is not the current variant. So in theory, what they're hoping is that if I get the old variant, it may protect me from the new variant. We don't have any evidence of that. Because what we currently see is people get shots and then they get COVID. Sometimes they get more shots, they get COVID again. I'm willing to bet that almost everyone in this room has had COVID at least once. All right? If you haven't, it's pretty much a miracle. <laughs> but the, the fact is that everyone in this room has been exposed to COVID. Right? Some people had the personal experiences with it. Some were mild. Some were not so mild. So how do we go forward from here? 
And one is to understand that this is treatable and that early intervention is the key. And when I say early intervention, I'm really clear. You have sneezing for a day. You have a sore throat that you didn't have yesterday. It isn't, I haven't been will feeling well for the last 7 to 14 days. That's late. When I say early intervention, I mean the day that you feel a little fatigued. Because nothing that we're going to do is going to hurt you. So the new variant versus older ones, this is a much more mild case. I'm not saying that if people can't get sick from this, because if you have underlying medical disease, you can get sick. But the most important thing is if you treat early, that your chances of going to the hospital are greatly reduced. Common sense. Grandma's rules. This is what I call them. Wash your hands, wash your nose, and wash your mouth. I don't mean soap with all of them. <laughs> so, washing your hands with soap. Soap and water, not the chemicals. Because I don't like have people being exposed to all of the chemicals. So I'm really promoting get the soap out, wash your hands with real soap, lather it up, wash your hands. You can do it as often as you want. Wash your nose. The virus enters your body through your nose and mouth. And there are nasal sprays, um, X-Lear, so it's X-L-E-A-R, Cofix RX are two, as well as hypochlorous acid. It's a nasal spray you can use multiple times a day, and it kills viruses or reduces the amount of virus in your nose. All right? Safe and effective. Some people even use low dose hydrogen peroxide. So many of my patients who were older said this is what they've been doing their whole life. They diluted hydrogen peroxide, and they used it in their nose. If you get, are feeling sick, all right, you want a 1% betadine solution, which is Cofix RX is the brand for that. But you can simply make it, which I did. So you get normal saline, you figure out how many, it's a math problem. If you need help with the math, we can help you with the math. And you make a 1% solution, you put it in your nose. For your mouth, for your mouth, um, gargling with Scope, Listerine, other products, um, clean the virus, kill the virus in your nose and mouth, in your mouth, gargling does. It's very effective. When I, and I talk all over the state, I travel, I use these protocols. And they are very effective. I have a sore throat, a tickle in my throat, I gargle, and with one hour, within one hour, generally, the tickle is gone. If it comes back, I gargle again. So this is not, you know, voodoo, <laughs> all right? It actually does work, and it's been proven scientifically to work. Eat right. So when I say eat right, it's eat real food. We are a society that's really addicted to fast food and junk food. I want you to set it aside and begin eating food and go on a, limit the sugar in your diet. And sugar means, <laughs> I know this is tough, um, sugar means your, not just your cake, your cookies, it means your bread, your potatoes, your pasta, and your rice. And my husband is Italian, 
So when we gave up pasta, <laughs> uh, we made do, all right? But I want to tell you how important that is because illness loves sugar. Bacteria love sugar. Cancer loves sugar. And when you begin to eliminate that from your life, not only do you lose weight, but you are energized in a way you never have been before. Dr. Merrick likes to say, if it doesn't look like food, it's not food. <laughs> if it comes in a box, it's not food. All right, if it's processed or if you can't read the words on the label, don't eat it. Drink plenty of water. Um, this is about, I'm going to move into the next thing. It's about mask. Breathing. So surgical masks were used in the emergency room to stop, if a doctor sneezed or coughed, it would prevent that, the splatter from going into the wound. It came out the sides. <laughs> so when you sneeze, the mask is not tight on the doctor's face. It prevented things from going forward, but not out the sides, okay? A surgical mask, using a surgical mask to prevent COVID is like trying to use a chain link fence to stop mosquitoes. It does not work. All right? I understand that people will wear them if they don't feel well, if they're coughing, all right? But if you're doing it to prevent this, you would, it would be better to use a nasal spray and gargle and breathe the fresh air. In particular, children have messy faces, all right? And that is, creates bacteria on those masks. And so essentially what they're doing is breathing in bacteria all day long. And this doesn't even go to the toxic elements of some of the filaments in those masks. And kids can be allergic to those. The harm. The biggest harm I see as a medical professional, one is the lie, but the harm to our children. In this, we sacrificed our children. Because wearing a mask stopped their development. They need to see a person's face and under, to or, in order to understand their words and their affect, their emotions. The number of speech and language delays that is occurring in our young children because they couldn't see mom and dad speak and how they enunciated words is through the ceiling. The speech and language evaluations and referrals can never, we, I don't know if we'll ever catch up. It is going to require moms and dads to take over and help all of those young kids understand affect again, understand your emotions, and understand speech. But even as an older person, when I would be out and somebody would talk to me through a mask, I could not understand them. And it was frustrating, not only for me, but for them. Can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? And it was all unnecessary. For people who are wearing the N95 mask, all right, those were designed to stop dust particles, and a virus is even smaller than dust, all right? And for some people, they had a buildup of carbon dioxide, which is what we want to exhale and not inhale again. And I also had patients, when they were wearing these, their oxygen levels dropped 
because they stop taking full breaths. And so one of the most important things is when you are breathing is to take a full breath. And when you're sick, you want to expand the lower lungs. And so patients who were sick were wearing masks and they weren't expanding the lower lungs and this was causing a setup for pneumonia. So be on guard because we have some in the medical community are saying we have to bring the masks back. It doesn't mean you have to comply. All right, you can simply say no, thank you. That's your choice. At one point, I would, they would say, you need to wear a mask, and I would say, I am wearing it, and it was on my wrist. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, my concern is some people in the government and government positions have said, we're not going to bring back mask mandates. However, the government has not stepped into private businesses and private schools that did mandate them and do mandate them. And so there has been no reprieve, particularly for college students who are at private universities, because they're still under some of those mandates. And it is not beyond our federal government to particularly say that if you have a federal contract, you have to mandate. It is not beyond Health and Human Services to say if you have a hospital or a clinic, in order to receive reimbursement for Medicare or Medicaid, you have to follow these mandates. One of the most important things I tell families when someone is sick is open the windows and open the doors and go outside and have your meals outside. Now, that is not possible everywhere. But generally, you d when particularly we have central air, central heat, and we are recirculating the virus. If we open the windows and get fresh air in, we are letting the virus go out into the atmosphere where it will be killed. But if we keep it in the house, it just recirculates. Everyone in the house gets sick. All right, but if you open the windows, particularly in bedrooms, all right, you crack the window, particularly at night, they get fresh air circulating. It is immensely helpful. And this tradition of fresh air goes back in the medical literature at least to 1744, all right, not new. And we knew in the pandemics of 1918 that they took hospital beds outside. And it was one of the key things in promoting healing sunshine. All right, we get a little bit of that here in Virginia. Vitamin D is essential. At the beginning of the pandemic, we, there were people screaming, doctors screaming, please get your vitamin D up. Vitamin D is essential for the immune system. And people of color tend to have lower vitamin D levels because of the pigmentation in their skin. But we could have gone into these communities and we could have said, let's check your vitamin D levels. We want everybody above 50. If you have medical, underlying medical problems, let's get it above 75. And we could have worked at that. Because what we learned is that if you had a vitamin D level greater than 50, your chances of dying from COVID approached zero. A simple intervention. Going to the doctor, having your vitamin D level checked or not checked, but getting a daily dose of vitamin D. The average dose for an adult is 5,000 international units to 10,000 international units a day. Some people, and it's rare, cannot take that much, all right? And I will be honest about that. I've been prescribing vitamin D for over 20 years, and in that time I have two patients who cannot take a high dose of vitamin D. And that means that five, an average do, adult dose is 5,000. So these people need to take 500 to 1,000. 
but that's two people in 25 years. Vitamin C. Linus Pauling continues to be right. Vitamin C has tremendous anti-inflammatory properties, and it's great for the immune system. So a typical dose, 500 to 1,000 milligrams twice a day. Zinc and quercetin. So zinc is um, a mineral that needs a piggyback ride into your cell, and quercetin is the piggyback, is the horse that brings zinc in, okay? So you take them together, and this boosts your immune system, and it helps kill the virus, all right? Stops the virus from replicating. So, and this works for any virus. So cold, flu, COVID, all right? So these are things that it isn't specific for COVID. It works for any virus that you may have. You do not, when you take zinc and quercetin, if you're taking ivermectin, you don't take them at the same time. Other supplements that are tremendously helpful, black cumin, melatonin. So melatonin, people say, well, you take that to sleep. The reason it's on the protocol developed by the frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance is that it's anti-inflammatory, all right? So we learned a lot about regular supplements and that they had multiple roles. So one of the roles is that melatonin can help you rest at night, but can also decrease the inflammation. Turmeric is wonderful for decreasing inflammation. An aspirin a day, so a typical aspirin is 325 milligrams. It's used to prevent clots. And then probiotics. So kefir is a probiotic and just general probiotics. Other supplements are elderberry, fish oil. Fish oil is one of my favorites uh, because of its anti-inflammatory properties. And it also helps with aches and pains. So it's instead of for me just personally, you, I don't go to aspirin or Tylenol or Motrin for aches and pains. I go to fish oil. Um, B-complex, NAC or N-acetylcysteine, fluvoxamine. So fluvoxamine is an antidepressant. And this is the work of um, Steve Kirsch. And if any of you know, Steve Kirsch is the founder of Vax Safety. Um, he's an engineer. He was the guy who designed the mouse, the elliptical mouse, all right? And he went in and did research in, on repurposed drugs and found that fluvoxamine is helpful in treating COVID because the virus binds to a receptor called the ACE receptor, and fluvoxamine prevents that binding. So again, a safe, available drug that was available to prevent the virus from getting into the cell to replicate, and his work was squashed. The two important ones, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Ivermectin was first used to treat parasitic illness. But what we found is that in COVID, and there were people who, one of, there was a nursing home example where in nursing homes, if there's a scabies outbreak, which is spare, a parasite, they treat everyone in the nursing home with ivermectin. And the doctor noticed that nobody got COVID. So he said, repeat. He had five nursing homes that he covered, and he prevented a lot of death. Um, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine can be used in pregnancy. It already has a record of safety in pregnancy. So the concept of giving a shot to a pregnant mother or a woman who is planning on becoming pregnant is against the golden rule of pregnancy and of motherhood. We want to do everything to protect women of childbearing age. And we never, ever, ever, ever give an experimental thing to a pregnant woman. 
supplies to have at home. <laughs> A thermometer, and I, I don't say that lightly because when I get phone calls, it, is, it has occurred that people say, I don't have a thermometer because I'm usually not sick. So have a thermometer, have a pulse oximeter, so we can, you can measure your oxygen. We want your oxygen level to be greater than 90. Um, have the name, address, phone numbers of compounding pharmacies and pharmacies that will uh, dispense ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. And contact information for the doctors who are willing to help. So the FLCCC, uh, Frontline COVID Doctors, um, MyFreeDoctor.com, there are a number of them. Uh, and sometimes people email us and we try to send them doctors in their area who are treating um, COVID. Um, the shot, the jab, whatever you want to call it, it's not a vaccine because it doesn't prevent you from getting it and it doesn't prevent it from being transmitted. My biggest concern about the shots is the rate of vaccine injury. It is a lipid nanoparticle that comes in, that's being injected into your system it goes to every organ in the body. It passes the blood-brain barrier, and this is why we're seeing tremendous amounts of neurological disease, because all the neurons in your brain are covered in fat. That's, to keep, that's the insulation around your nerves. And that lipid nanoparticle goes into that and creates inflammation and scarring. That's resulting in huge numbers of neurological injury, stroke, multiple sclerosis, other demyelinating diseases. The, what we do know is that the lipid nanoparticle also targets the ovary and testy. We are seeing one of the biggest rises in infertility worldwide and what we know from countries is that the higher the vaccination rate the higher the infertility rate in my practice i also see people who have a certain genetic disorder they're non-metabolizers of folate and folate is what you it's a b vitamin and those patients who have that are not able to man metabolize folate, also have the highest degree of injury. Um, overall, from the very first data that was released by Pfizer, they noted that there was an, all cause, an increase in what we call all-cause mortality. That means People are, may not die of COVID, but they're dying of other things. So we have seen a spike of cancer, autoimmune disease, and sudden death. And for anybody who watches sports, we've seen it on television on too frequent a basis. I just read a study that followed adolescents, 40 adolescents for one year. 73% had cardiac injury. I ask the medical community, was all that money worth it to sacrifice our children? Do not comply. That is a personal choice. You can be supported in that decision. You do not have to feel alone. For children in school, thank God for homeschoolers. And I think every church, every single church, should open their doors and become a school.
do your homework. Don't believe me. Go to flccc.net. Go to Peter McCullough, Robert Malone, Paul Merrick, Pierre Corey. You Google these names and you will first find out that they are spreaders of disinformation. Keep reading if you see the warning. Pray. God has his hand on us and he will lead us out of this. I want you to pray in particular for the medical community, the doctors, the nurses. Many of them are very confused. Many of them are very conflicted because they are essentially owned by their hospitals and to speak out or to not comply means they will lose their job. But what they need to hear is that if they are courageous and walk away, their practices will be full. Pray for each other. And reach out and take the hands of those around you and know that you are connected. And that touch is healing. And we never want to give that up. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start out with a question that um, somebody said this the other day and I tried to research it and Dr. Uh, Paul Merrick, we had him here mm, about a year, a little over a year ago, but somebody said he was reinstated to the medical, do you know if that's true or not? He does not, he's not currently employed. Um, he lost his job from Centera Norfolk General. Um, they did move to revoke his board certifications. Um, I think that that occurred, and I don't think they have been reinstated. I know that some doctors have had their board certifications reinstated, but it's everyone is an individual case, and I don't have an update on him. Okay. Couldn't find anything on it myself. If you are watching live stream, if you do have a question, if you can uh, text us in and uh, we'll, we'll give your question to, to Dr. Fury. If you have a question, uh, Pastor Josue, are you going to be our mic runner, sir? Okay, we got a mic over by Sylvia, and then you can take the one out of my hand, Ken, if you'll handle your side. If you have a question, just raise your hand, keep it up until one of our runners comes to you. There you go, Ken, the first one right there. We're, we're asking you to speak into the mic because we have people live streaming and they will hear the question that way also. Hi. I have a question about the variant. How do they know which variant is what? Because when the first one came out, which I has just left my head, um, I was thinking how in the world do they know which one that is when they, they hadn't tested? Or they don't, do they have a way to tell you, well, this is this? Right, they can look at the genetic makeup of the variants. And so they put them, um, there's a, a mechanism, a test that they can do that shows different changes in the genetic makeup. And that's how they know one line from the other. Thank you. I don't have a question, but just a comment. And um, as a naturopath, I really appreciate all of the alternative uh, means that you gave to us to address our immune system. But I would like to just add one, and I don't remember the source of the study because it's been a few years, but I did read a study one time that said that when you consume sugar, and like you said, it's not just your cakes and cookies, but the other as well, that your immune system is suppressed by about 50% for up to four hours. So when you indulge, 
it, it really affects your immune system more than you realize. Thank you. Thank you for your information. Question, what's your thoughts on steaming? I understand um, that if the heat from steam, since it goes through your nose, kind of kills the germs. Steam can be very helpful in opening the passages, particularly if you're very congested, and can help, depending on how you do it, can help calm some of the inflammation, but it doesn't kill anything, okay? And so, and we do also don't want you to scald your nasal passages, all right? Um, so we want something that will kill the virus. And so the normal saline with betadine or 1% betadine solution actually kills the virus. Okay, and my other question is, if you have ivermectin, when should you start taking it? So, Consult with a doctor, <laughs> all right? And uh, typically what I do is I look at, for my patients, I look at what their symptoms are. And if I feel like they have some room to play, I do the vitamin regime first. If they're at high risk, then I look at immediately intervening with ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, or both. All right, and then I make a decision depending on the symptom profile of whether or not to add an antibiotic. But it's all based on how they present and what their underlying health conditions are. We, we have one back here. If you've already taken the shot, um, and you're recovering from the side effects of that. So all the things that you've mentioned is helping to rebuild the immune system. Can you give us an approximate time frame of how long it takes your body to recover from the vaccine? I'm sorry that you're vaccine injured and I'm glad that you're getting help. Um, it varies. I have and just so I can, this is just from my patient population. Um, I have people who take ivermectin every day. And some of them have been doing that for over a year. Some of the symptoms have, the acuity of the symptoms have decreased, but some of them continue to have symptoms. And so what we do is we look and I consult with you know, other doctors. I refer them on to other doctors so that we can get a more a comprehensive evaluation. But I don't give up hope. One of the things I also look at is the use of hyperbaric oxygen in vaccine injured. Um, I look at lots of alternatives um, because they've been more helpful in the long run than traditional medicine. But I also, I think one of the most important things is I recognize that vaccine injury does exist. And many patients come to me with a psychiatric referral saying it's all in your head. And it's not. You know, other than it's in their head because they've had neurological injury. But this is not something fictitious. Um, you spoke earlier about not necessarily dying of COVID, but other illnesses. Can you comment at all on the effects or side effects of remdesivir? Or is that open a Pandora's box? You can ask. <laughs> so <laughs> as you. many of you know that remdesivir has been nicknamed when death is near. Um, remdesivir was used in the Ebola trials, and the arm of its trial was stopped because of the injury and death. And Dr. Fauci decided to resurrect this drug, and it has over 50% go into um, kidney failure. So when you're in the hospital with severe COVID, your lungs are compromised, 
because your lungs are compromised, your heart is working really hard. And that's two of the major organ systems. So then you have your kidneys and your liver. I don't like to take those out. And many people who went on remdesivir ended up on dialysis. And so one of the things that happens on dialysis is you can get fluid overload. So you can get fluid in the lungs. The lungs were already compromised. And this is what led their, to their deaths. So it's very sad. I wish they would take it off the market. Go ahead. Um, is there really such a thing as long COVID, or is it covering up vaccine injury, or is it both? Let's say you just had the illness, you were never vaccinated. Could you have similar symptoms to someone who was vaccinated and injured? There, it's a difficult thing to tease out, but you do it by history. And yes, long COVID does exist. Uh, there are patients who had, uh, were hospitalized with COVID, may have been intubated, and are very sick and remain ill for long periods of time. And so it takes a very long time to bring about healing in their bodies. And so giving them multiple avenues, for in particular, using the nutraceutical-based or other alternative medicine bases to bring about healing. And really, it takes a lot of support, but yes, I do believe long COVID exists as well as severe vaccine injury. Not necessarily, okay? The long COVID is often is related to the lungs and the heart, all right? And when we have vaccine injury, we often have more diffuse injury. So we have severe neurological injury. We have, sometimes we have more blood clots. Um, and so when we look at the clots that are caused in particular from the vaccine uh, or the shot, they're what we call amyloid clots. So they're these long stringy things that are not your typical um, clots that you would see in other clotting disorders. I This is a tough one. Uh, this is about uh, people who are waiting for transplants. And I don't know where we are in Virginia at this moment, but it was the, the standard operating policy of the teaching hospitals in the state of Virginia that if you were not vaccinated, you would not get a transplant. So there are people who are literally on transplant lists or were on transplant lists who have been removed because they will not get the shot. What I can tell you about one particular patient I know who did get, who needed a transplant, elected to get the shots. So after the first shot, he required placement on ECMO, which is he had to have a machine work for his lungs and heart. So that was, he was doing, he was stable went immediately on ECMO, had his second shot, began a clotting disorder. Had he not had an organ available, he would have died. And he has elected not to have any further, and his transplant team is not pleased. But I think he's still alive because he's made that decision. So, okay. Listen, I'm ready to this um, vaccine injuries. So we have to look at what the history behind the, the vaccine injury. So what is the dates? What are your, when did the symptoms first occur? They can occur in every organ system. 
So it, we can't just say, well, if you've got neurological symptoms, it's from the shot. Or if you have cardiac symptoms, it's from the shot. Or lung or clotting or muscular symptoms. I wish we could say that, right? But every system of the body is affected, right? Women have taken the brunt. Two-thirds of injuries are women. And menstrual dysregulation is one of the chief things. And that is often dismissed. All right? You're stressed. It's an abnormal cycle. Just wait a few months, right? These are not the ways that you approach it, and you really have to find somebody who's willing to work with you and understands vaccine injury. So is there any data that connects the number of boosters of vaccines, like the more shots you get, the higher degree you have vaccine injury? Yes. So the more shots you get, there's a, a data that Peter McCullough just recently published, and I think a number of other people, uh, I think it's on Steve Kirsch's website also, that as you get more and more, your likelihood of being hospitalized and dying increases, right? A lot of that also depends on what your underlying medical illnesses are. I don't want people to panic, right, and say, I've got five shots, I'm going to die tomorrow, okay? I believe that God is good <laughs> and that if they begin to look at and support their own immune system and their own health, that's going to be helpful. But we can't predict that. And I think you've sort of answered my question, but I thought I read a study about a group, I think it was Brazil, where they had healthcare workers that they had a, one group that took ivermectin prophylactically, and they had absolutely no transmission, they, no one contracted COVID and the other group didn't. And there was, it was, I don't remember, 60% contracted COVID while they were caring for patients. And so that was my question is taking ivermectin prophylactically, prophylactically, is it, does it actually diminish your immune system over a period of time? It doesn't diminish your immune system. So many people, I actually have patients who take ivermectin prophylactically. I have some patients who are very high risk um, and so we put them on a regime once a week. Sometimes it depends on what their exposure levels are, and I evaluate those individually. But taking prophylactic ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine is absolutely possible. Um, I do it when I travel. So I get on an airplane, I take ivermectin. Yeah, this is, uh, this is povidone iodine or betadine, all right? This is the chemical name for it. And so you have, make a 1% solution of this. So if you take one teaspoon of this and you put in nine teaspoons of normal saline, you have a 1% solution. And then you squirt that in your nose multiple times a day if you have symptoms and you'll be able to smell the betadine, and it goes away pretty quickly, all right? But it does work, and it's very effective. No, you, you just put it, you spray it in your nose. I don't use this to swap. I don't put this in my mouth, all right? I use a Scope or Listerine or one of the other ones um, in my mouth, but this is for the nose. My question was, what percent of the ivermectin do you recommend prophylactic? I can't, I'm not going to answer that one, all right? <laughs> um, I can um, do a phone call, something individually on that one, but I won't answer that one. Okay. okay. And concerning the povidine iodine, online on um, Amazon, you can purchase those 
spray bottles, empty spray bottle glass ones. Yes. If you want to make the mixture yourself. Right, so you can purchase bottles, and if you go on Amazon, they usually have all three of them, the bottles, the nasal spray, and, and the betadine, all for you to click right away. Um, what I will say in reference to the standard dose of ivermectin for when you're sick is 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram per day. All right, so that's a standard dose, and the standard dose, and this is from the FLCC protocol. Uh, the standard dose of hydroxychloroquine is 200 milligrams twice a day. You do not take them, you don't take hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin at the same time. And that's part of the FLCCC protocol. Right, right here. Ma'am. Hi. I read a couple of reports uh, for young adults where after the uh, shot they develop POTS. If someone that already had dot POTS, would that shot make the POTS worse? It could. Is there, there's data for that? I, I, I know of significant amount of the increase in POTS uh, after the vaccine. It would make sense that if you already have an underlying disease that it could become worse. What we do know specifically is that people who had underlying autoimmune diseases, and you could throw POTS in that category, had significant increases in their symptoms after the shots. Um, hi, uh, just a quick question. We might have missed it, or I might have missed it, but where can we obtain the ivermectin? Is that a prescription, or how do we get that? Ivermectin is a prescription, so you can um, FLCCC, so 3Cs.net, Frontline, America's Frontline Doctors, My Free Doctor. You can send a, um, an email to our group, Virginia Medical Freedom Alliance, so VAMFA.org, and say, I need a doctor and tell me where you live, and we'll try to hook you up with doctors in your area or hook you up with other people. Um, where you can get a prescription for ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. That was your question. Okay. Um, last fall, we were in Tennessee and attending a Weston A. Price Foundation uh, conference, and they published um, addresses of local pharmacies, compounding pharmacies, where you could get ivermectin without a prescription in Tennessee. You just had to be 18 and up, and they weighed you and... You went on about your happy way with, they wrote you your name. So if you happen to be in Tennessee. Or know you, someone in Tennessee. Or, yes, there, there are opportunities that might be easier. I mean, now it's not illegal to prescribe or, you know, against the powers that be's rules, but Tennessee was super easy and really awesome. That's really positive what happened in Tennessee. So they made ivermectin over the counter so in most of the world, um, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine are over the counter, all right? And as many people know, um, hydroxychloroquine is used to treat malaria. It's called Sunday Sunday, and they would take a pill every Sunday, all right? And so many of the African and Indian nations had a ready supply of these medications. Um, in Virginia, so the FDA was spanked uh, in reference to ivermectin, and that was a lawsuit that part of Paul Merrick was a plaintiff in that, where he sued the FDA about um, it's a horse dewormer, don't take it. Uh, just to remind the FDA, we give Prozac to our dogs, so I don't know why they made preferences, but they had a deliberate agenda. Here in Virginia, we have a lot of hoops to jump through to fill prescriptions, and those remain. So when I write for prescriptions, I am still having to go to mail uh, compounding pharmacies. And my fear is that if we, you go to CVS or Walgreens or one of the big box 
stores to get medications, they are going to charge you astronomical amounts for, the, for it to be filled. I also still have to jump through multiple pages of forms and they ask me the reasons why I'm dispensing this drug, right? A safe, effective medication. And you guys all have, most of you have Tylenol in your medicine, medicine cabinet. Tylenol causes more fertali fatalities in a single year than ivermectin probably ever has. I'd just like to say I applaud you. Uh, I really thank God for you, uh, for doing what you're doing, and pray that God's protection will certainly be over you. Um, when you mentioned uh, my son, one of my sons got the second shot, and it attacked his liver. Uh, he was on a liver transplant. His system got broke down so poorly uh, he's in and out of the hospital now. He's been taken off of the liver transplant and expected to die just treating him. But I really applaud you, and I just encourage you to just keep standing. But I do believe that prayer, when you mention prayer, prayer is the key because many people have been deceived, I personally believe. Thank you. Some people take it every day. Um, so I don't have any objections. If you're not having side effects, you take it every day. Um, you know, you may not take, you may take a smaller dose. I have patients who take 10 milligrams a day versus I have patients who take 50 milligrams a day of zinc and then they take, you know, quercetin with it. So it, that's an individual choice and those are discussions you can have with your doctor or your natural path or some of the, the, the really good uh, centers, in particular in this area, you've got a really lot of good naturopathic physicians or alternative medicine people to seek out. Okay. What are indicators of vaccine injury? If you are not able to do what you did before the shot, you're vaccine injured. So if before the shot you were active, working, running around, doing your daily life, and there was no problems, and now you struggle to get out of bed, or some days you can get out of bed, but other days you can't, I would look at vaccine injury. Right, uh, cardiac symptoms, people have cardiac arrhythmias, I've had strokes, I have flares of autoimmune disease, I have patients who have trouble walking um, so that their legs just give out. Um, neurologic injury, um, memory difficulty, so brain fog is one of the big things that people talk about in long COVID but you can absolutely see brain fog in, uh, after the shots and dementia, multiple sclerosis. You did, there's over 900 in the, in the initial studies. There were over 900 severe, not mild, severe injuries in the Pfizer data. That is well over 1,500 now. So this is about how do you get treatment or how do you get linked up with doctors who prescribe ivermectin who treat um, COVID early. So again, I'm gonna say go to the flccc.net. 
all right, Americans Frontlines Doctors, My Free Doctor. You can also go to our website at bamfa.org. Go to the contact information, send us an email, all right, and also sign up for our newsletter. <laughs> um, and we will, I'll respond to those. Sometimes it takes a while. If you don't get a response, do it again. But we do try to get to those within 24 to 48 hours. Okay? Got some other questions. Is there an um, alternative site that you would recommend as opposed to VAERS? Uh, VAERS is, VAERS, we know that there's lots of difficulties with VAERS. So VAERS is the Vaccine Adverse Reaction Monitoring System that is run by the CDC. The issue with that is that we know that they've deleted cases. We also know, and this is from years ago, Harvard did a study and they felt that it captured about 1% of vaccine injury. It is the opinion of the leading epidemiologist in this country. And uh, so Harvey Kirsch, who's from Yale, and other people, that the underreporting factor of vaccine injury is between 31 and 41%. I want you to let that sink in. Dr. Yaden, uh, he was from Pfizer. He no longer works for Pfizer. Um, believes millions have died from the shots. I believe that. I also believe that the infertility problem that we are going to have is going to be heartbreaking. In your opinion, uh, do you think that the federal health agencies will ever back down on their stance, or are they just too corrupted by the pharmaceutical agencies? I mean, companies. In my opinion, <clears throat> I would not put my life in their hands. And you also have to remember that the CDC and the FDA do not practice medicine. They are governmental agencies. All right? Yet their guidelines, all right, were simply to make the pharmaceutical companies rich. Any other questions? <laughs> here you go, Ken. Down here. Okay, I have two. Hi, Dr. Fury. Um, do we have any other vaccines on the market yet that are using the lipid nanoparticles as a means to deliver um, the treatment? And then secondly, um, and I don't know if you'll know this or not, has, has anybody come up with a way to get around having to wear the mask if you have to go to the hospital? Because frankly, I just won't go, which I think is not a good idea, or I probably will get arrested but, um, for, not, for not wearing. But does anybody have anything that you could medically say that could keep, that, keep you from having to wear it? Yeah, we've written medical exemptions for them. All right, so there it is possible to show that you have a health condition that prevents you from having, that causes you distress when wearing a mask, and we can do medical exemptions for those. Um, in terms of the lipid nanoparticle, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but the issue and where we need to be very concerned 
is the FDA has approved the platform, so the semi-trailer truck, of the lipid nanoparticle. So the payload, so what goes in the back, for COVID-19 is the spike protein strand of mRNA. With the payload, or with the, the semi-trailer truck, the, L, the lipid nanoparticle being approved, there is nothing to prevent them from using every, for every vaccine, using this as the delivery system. And the danger of that could be that they will automatically change the current vaccine schedules to a lipid nanoparticle base and put measles, mumps, rubella in there and not tell you that it is a lipid nanoparticle base. And this is something we have to watch very carefully for. We already know the dishonesty with the childhood vaccine schedule. And that when they tested, and this is my only one caveat, um, those vaccines, they did not test those against true placebos. And they never tested giving you five at a time. There's no data to say that this is safe. And yet Virginia law, they tell you, this is the law, you have to get all of these shots. And they don't want to tell you about religious exemptions and they don't want to tell you about medical exemptions. So I want you to know that they exist I also want you to be very cautious because in Virginia law, if they just declare a state of emergency, it ends all of your religious and medical exemptions. Now, how much that's going to be enforced depends on our ability to stand linked, and say no. God comes first. Amen. Here you go, way over here, Ken. Run, Kenny, run. I was just wanting to give reference to the mask mandate. And we're from California, don't hold that against us. But in California, my wife and I literally handed out the mask, your constitutional rights to not have to wear a mask, to not be disallowed into an establishment. So it is unconstitutional for them to do that. So if you need the information, I have the brochures. We handed them out in California. We did not wear a mask at all. And we were attacked. But this, this is, when people talk to us, it's just a mask. It's not just a mask. It's, a, it's an attack on our freedom, period. And it does absolutely nothing to protect us. So I will give you that information. I'd be happy to. Thank you. We don't have any more questions coming on through text, right do we? Here. Okay, another one. The nanoparticle, um, you said lipid nanoparticle. Mm -hmm. So the delivery of nanoparticles without the mRNA, is it still a problem if there's, it just means that things go in really, really fast or? So the lipid nanoparticle, so that's the delivery, that's the semi-trailer truck, mm -hmm. okay? And why is that dangerous? It's because, number one, it passes the blood-brain barrier, right? We don't want things to pass the blood-brain barrier, okay? 
and it goes to every organ system in the body, all right? So if, you know, it stays in your arm is a lie, right. okay? So when we took other shots, all right, there was limited range about where that would go. That is not true with this delivery system. And so what it, and in particular where it's most concerning is obviously the brain, the ovary, and the testy, okay? But you have to know every single organ system in the body is affected. Um, so is there anything that would be safe to have come through a nanoparticle? Any other medication, glutathione, you familiar with that one? Yes, I'm a feeling, yes. Um, oh. I don't. I would not recommend. I need to know more about whatever it is that they're delivering. Mm -hmm. All right. In that, you know, I know that in there are experimental cases for people who have life-threatening diseases. That's a different scenario. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, but for what we're looking at now, when we know that we have treatment protocols that are safe and effective and don't damage or put a person at risk for other side effects is the treatment of choice for me. Okay. And children can opt out of all of these vaccines with a religious exemption, the little ones now in Virginia? So in Virginia, you have a right to religious exemptions. Um, for, and so the law in Virginia in terms of children is that you have um, they're required, the, the childhood immunization schedule applies to preschools, daycares, regular school, home school, everybody. So even if you're homeschooling, you need to do a religious exemption, right? And if you're having, the school district is giving you difficulty or challenging your religious exemption, then you can contact us and we'll put you in touch with lawyers. Um, and religious exemptions should hold, all right? One of the things that they do allow for in the law is that if there's an outbreak of, say, the measles, and your child has not been vaccinated, then you might not be able to go to school, all right? But there, we can look at, that's a very lengthy discussion. <laughs> um, but good places to go about childhood immunization data is the Children's Health Defense, the, somebody just met, the uh, Weston A. Price Foundation, all right? The book that we have on the table out there is Turtles All the Way Down, Vaccine Science and Myth. I th the first chapter should be required reading for every parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, all right? If you know somebody who's a child or you're a child or you're an adult, you should read chapter one. That's all you need to read, okay? Hi. I just had uh, something I wanted to share with you all. I'm not disputing what you said, but I was listening to a doctor that said, we need to be careful with Listerine scope because there's something in it as far as chemical wise that can affect. Because it also the doctor said, men using Barbasol to shave, it is lowering their testosterone. So we really just need to be careful and look at the label he said. So. He's using something now, and I need to go back and listen, that even what he uses is more natural, and it keeps the beard from coming out as quickly, you know, so he doesn't have to shave as often, this new stuff he found. So I'm going to listen again. But it's just all the way around things in our products. Right. So one of the things, and, I, and a lot, I'm not a big fan of Scope or Listerine either, okay, but I know they're part of the protocol. Um, so hypochlorous acid is much more natural and doesn't have the other chemicals that may be in scope or Listerine. What's that name again? Hypochlorous acid, and I think it's on one of the slides. 
Uh, I think I put it on one of the slides. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, while Ken is running. I'm running. Okay. This also came in from the. Listerine was based on thymol, which is a, a constituent of the plant thyme, which is antiviral, antimicrobial, and all that. So if you do essential oils, you can use thyme in whatever liquid you want and gargle with that instead of using the scope and the Listerine, because that's basically what Listerine used to be, and now it's a chemical version of it. So there's... There are some good essential oils that can be gargled and inhaled with steam and things that are safer. Essential oils are great, so I have no problem with any of those. So this is the question. In January 2022, I had the third shot. In three days, I was um, in Riverside fighting for my life. I had a UTI, sepsis, kidney failure. It left me unable to walk, ended up in rehab for 11 months. I was totally independent, lived alone, and drove a car before this. Could you say if there was a possibility it was caused by the shot? Uh, Whoa. All right. Um, I said the, the betadine solution is 1%, not 10%. So the bottle, when you get the, the bottle, the picture on the bottle is 10%, and that's why you dilute it with, no, with normal saline. So it's one teaspoon of the betadine or povidone iodine, and then nine teaspoons of normal saline. And yes, I would look at the time sequence. Unless you had an underlying UTI at that moment that you got the shot, you know, we have to look at this. But clearly, the imp impact and what the shot does is it diminishes your immune system and your ability to fight infection. So if there was an underlying infection at the time, it certainly made things worse. And if you're sick, you shouldn't take a shot. So like when we, when, our, when we had kids and we took them into the doctor, if they had a fever at the well-child check and they were scheduled to get immunizations, they would say, nope, not today. All right, that didn't happen a lot when COVID. Well, typically, if you have, you know, sepsis can happen quickly, and it's dangerous, right? And so it's over 50% of people who get sepsis die. That's just reality. Um, it's, and it's a very hard reality. But thank God for people like Dr. Paul Merrick, all right? Because he, part of his sepsis protocol was high-dose vitamin C, and the anti-inflammatory immune boosting effect of IV vitamin C has helped reverse that trend worldwide. Um, so it's the long, what I'm looking at is you've got long-term sequelae. I would treat with, you know, when I see people who are complex, I look and I keep looking and I keep looking. So we try one method of treatment, we see if it works, we do it for a period of time. If we're not making anywhere, we can change course. But I've had patients who've been very ill, and, I'm, and I know how painful it is. And I know how they lose hope. But what I try to do is listen to them, support them, and know that God is working, and if the door is open, we're going to find the path to healing. And that's what's key.
2022, I had COVID and didn't know I had COVID. I had no symptoms, anything. Since that point, I've had no taste and no smell. What will help that? So, um, so n that's no taste, no smell after COVID did happen. And there are supplements that we can talk about later that may help with that, all right? But um, we can look at that. Um, one of the things that they've tried is alpha lipoic acid. Um, but what we're trying to do is restore health in that area. And the reason taste and smell were affected, and in particular smell, is because in your nose and where your smell center is, those nerve fibers are very small. And the blood supply to those, if they were compromised in any way, through microclotting is how the damage was done, is one mechanism of how that damage could be done. But I don't rule it out forever, all right, because I've had people who we've treated with those symptoms and they've gotten better. But it, it's a long road. Do you need to repeat that name of that? You got it. All the way in the back, Ken. Well, there's people online that can't if you don't use the mic. They'll end up asking the same I'm not thing. sure where I heard this. Um, is there any way, in your opinion, uh, that they could intertwine this COVID with the flu vaccine? Uh, that's one, one of my comments. And the other, I would like to, this is of such value, this meeting tonight. Is it possible to have consent to bring this to this meeting to exposure to other people? For more people to be aware that's not listening maybe online tonight or even in the facility here it will be on our on our app and our website if in share it there's a, there were about a hundred people here I counted almost and so it'll be on our website or the app and you can take it and share it and uh, do that yes yeah if you don't dr. Fury do you mind doing that is that okay with you I have no objection as long as it's okay with her hey we're all for it <laughs> And I, I also want to make you aware of, on January 15th, it's a Monday, it's Martin Luther King Day, um, so it's a federal and state holiday, the Virginia Medical Freedom Alliance will be hosting an all-day summit in Richmond at the Marriott Hotel. It is protect our children, God's children are not for sale. With the corollary, we are all God's children. It is a day of national, international speakers who are going to speak about COVID, vaccines in general, toxins in our environment, the LGBTQ lie, um, child sex trafficking, what's going on in our public schools. So it is a day of education for everyone in the community to arm themselves with good information to bring back to your family and your church so that you have the tools to stand and say no more. We are not going to sacrifice our children to the government, to the sex industry, to the pharmaceutical industry, and the vaccine industry. Amen. Okay, another. Let's let this be the last one, okay? And she needs to get on the road to home. So thank you guys. These have been great questions and online participation also. Yes. When I was coming up, if I had symptoms of a cold, my grandmother would tell me, go gargle with salt water. Yeah. And um, that knocked it out. So what do you think about that? Grandma's right. Grandma's always right, yeah, always okay? Right. <laughs> Grandma is always right. Uh, go outside and play, gargle, do all those things, open the windows, all right? Those were great things. And, we, and if people think back to their childhood, particularly older people, they were healthy. When I was a kid, I had three shots. 
An average child today will have over 70. All right. How is it that we lived? All right? I, I, you know, I'm looking around. Some of you are older than me. All right, couple. And um, if, if, if the body was so vulnerable, none of us would be here. But God, God's pretty smart, you know? And he created the body with one backup mechanism after another. And if we don't get in the way, we are much healthier. So, thank all of you. I appreciate it, everything. Take a moment and just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that, Lord, your word declares many places, but Psalm 91, that we can find shelter, refuge, protection, health, life under the shadow of the wings of the Most High. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are our creator. You've created these bodies. You said it's, they are fearfully and wonderfully made, as Dr. Fury has shared and we thank you, Lord. We pray that hedge of protection around each one of us that have been here tonight, those that have heard this information, that, Father, we would be able to share it with other people. Not scare people, but prepare people, Father. And we do again, Lord. We pray over Dr. Fury and all the other doctors that, Lord, are trying to speak truth and trying to really get to the root of this and help people be whole and well. We ask for your protection over them. We pray that, Lord, where they have been censored and canceled before and cut out, we pray, Father, give them a new platform, God, a platform that truth can be spoken so that people can be helped, Father. We ask your blessings in this, in each life, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. We invite you to visit the table out in the lobby to the left. They have lots of information. Jennifer Hergut is out there who also works with uh, the Medical Alliance and they can answer further questions for you out there. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for joining us today at the WOW Center. We trust your life was enriched as you participated in worship and the Word. We invite you to call us with your prayer requests at 757-874-1223 or you can email those requests to prayer at wowcenter.org. If you are a first-time guest today, please take a moment and fill out and submit the welcome response, or as we like to call it, the Connect card, that you can find on the Wow Center mobile app and our website, wowcenter.org. If you would like to give to the ministries of WOW Center, then you can navigate to the Give tab on either the website or the mobile app. Also on our website and app, you'll be able to explore the many ministries of WOW Center and discover where you might be led to plug in to serve Father God and others and to help WOW Center pursue its mission to reach all people, restore the hurting, and disciple every believer into active ministry. Again, thanks for joining us today, and we hope you will consider attending a live service with us on Sundays at 8.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7.15 p.m. God bless you and keep you is our prayer, and thank you for your part in growing the kingdom.